at this point in the uh, the evening, we have to talk about Trump raid in Mar-a-Lago. We got to talk about IRS. There's a whole bunch of stuff we got to talk about from this past week. We're going to talk about it later tonight. Right now, we're going to move into the section of the uh, the Michael Badnarik tribute. So a couple of weeks ago, probably a month ago, our friend Michael Badnarik was in the hospital. And he's been in the hospital off and on many times over the past 10 years. He had a heart attack in 2009. And uh, he got out of the hospital and we were hopeful. And uh, he celebrated his 68th birthday on August 1st. And um, he had a birthday party a couple of weeks ago and he, he passed last week. So tonight, I want you, if you don't know who Michael Badnark is, I want to resolve that problem. I want to share with you some of his thoughts that he's said over the years and expressed with the public. Uh, some of them very incendiary, some of them very thought provoking. I wanted to share some of these thoughts so that you had that space for liberty and your rights and an appreciation of what this man dedicated his life to for a better part of 25 years, right up to the end. So Justin, the first clip I'd like to play is the first thing I've ever seen back in the day from Michael Badnark. It's a 2004 C-SPAN presentation. I was having to make the tough decision of, do you vote for Skull and Bones Kerry? Do you vote for Skull and Bones Bush? It was a real conundrum. And luckily, Lisa and I were watching this C-SPAN program, probably book TV. And then it ran into like the next show was political debate type situation. And I heard Michael's presentation. It made more sense than anything I had heard from any politician. And uh, it was at that point in 2004 when I stopped voting right after I voted for him for president of these United States. When uh, I figured out the the steering wheel in the back of the car is not connected to the wheels in the car, uh, Michael kindly explained that away for me through uh, libertarian philosophy that he expressed from a constitutional perspective. A very, you know, here's a a dead document that is no longer being changed. It's not a living document. The Constitution is dead. It's a dead document on purpose. And to learn where our rights originate, how they help us prosper and remain free, I think is an essential part of uh, what we need as the solution. Michael's observation was that you can tie almost every political problem we have back in this country back to the fact that individuals do not know, understand, and assert their rights. And it's because we don't as individuals that all this other chaos goes on. So what he said was, it's not his responsibility to fix freedom. It's our responsibility to fix freedom, every one of us. And he's no longer here. And he used to get told all the time, Michael, you can't die. We need you to fight for freedom. And he's like, you don't get it, do you? You need to learn to assert your rights and fight for freedom. Otherwise, it doesn't make a goddamn difference what Michael Badnarik does or does not do. So with that, let's go ahead and play. Uh, this priming video that was very influential to my philosophical growth and let's experience it together. And then uh, we'll move into the rest of the tribute. The sound of silence. That was a moment of silence there for Michael Badnarik while we find this clip. Here we go. Demonstrate that we are not satisfied with the status quo. Voting for the lesser of two evils that part and your one or candidate part two? wins and you still get evil. Part one. Two part. Okay. If you continue to vote for the Democrats or the Republicans, you are committing political suicide. The only chance we have of saving our constitutional republic is to vote libertarian. The Libertarian Party is the party of principle. We have candidates in every state, in every county, that are principled, passionate, and articulate. Please vote Libertarian and help us restore a free country. At this point, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you your 2004 presidential candidate, Michael Bednarik. Good evening, fellow delegates. Uh, good evening, fellow Americans. I'd like to share a, a quote from George Washington. Government is not reason. Government is not eloquence. It is force, and like fire, it is a dangerous servant 
and a fearful master. If you live in a log cabin, you'd require fire for your survival. You use the fire to heat your home and to cook your food. Fire is such a necessary part of your survival that you create a special place for fire. It is called a fireplace. Government is necessary for our survival. We need government in order to survive. The founding fathers created a special place for government. It is called the Constitution. Anytime the fire is in the fireplace, it is a good fire. Anytime a fire gets outside of the fireplace, it is a bad fire. Conversely, anytime the government stays within the limitations of the Constitution, it is a good government. Anytime the government is outside the Constitution, it is a bad government and it is time for us to stomp it out. The United States is the greatest economic country in the world, not because of government regulation, but in spite of it. Yeah. NAFTA and GATT have about as much to do with free trade as the Patriot Act has to do with liberty. possibly have free trade when Alan Greenspan can jockey the interest rate up and down. If Alan Greenspan sneezes in the morning, the Japanese stock market drops 20 points. We need to get the government out of regulating trade so that American workers can do what they do best, and that is to create wealth. The Declaration of Independence states, all men are created equal. And in 1776, that's exactly what they meant. Women could not vote, women could not own property, and blacks were considered property. After 200 years of enlightenment, we have realized that gender and race are inappropriate distinctions for determining who has individual rights. Yeah. The government gives you permission. They let you know that you have permission by giving you a permit or a license. If you have a marriage license, what do you have permission to do now that you did not have permission to do before? Who gave you that permission? And where did they get the authority to give you that permission in the first place? <laughs> With anyone you want, it is not the government's priority to set those standards. First thing that I would do would be to correct the characterization of our companies in Iraq as private enterprise. <laughs> when the government selects one specific com company to go into that country with carte blanche to do whatever they want, that is a government controlled monopoly. It would, <laughs> it would only be free market if there were other companies there to offer competitive uh, services and competitive prices to keep the uh, services down and also to allow the Iraqis to choose which of those companies is providing the service. None of those conditions exist, so it is not a free market system in Iraq. Libertarians are very strong on defense, but we also want the evidence. 
We need to know exactly who did what and why. Congress has the power to declare war. They also have the power to issue letters of mark and reprisal. In <laughs> instead of sending 100,000 troops overseas, we could probably send a smaller group of uh, U.S. Navy SEALs or Army Rangers and get the people who actually did this. But we need to have the evidence. Congress does not have the authority to grant the president carte blanche to go off and do whatever he chooses to do. <laughs> but concerned about the fact that Osama bin Laden was originally labeled as the culprit who perpetrated this atrocity. How have we gone from Osama bin Laden to Saddam Hussein? Where is the logic that allows us to switch from Afghanistan to Iraq? I did not see the halftime show. But I can, I, I am certain that Janet Jackson's breast is not the most obscene thing that we have seen on television. <laughs> when we have a Democratic president using the Oval Office on a regular basis for his little tryst, I find that far more offensive. I find it very offensive when the government tells me what I can and cannot watch. I actually find Jerry Springer far more offensive, and so I turn him off. <laughs> the American people should decide what is or is not obscene, and they will make that decision by watching or not watching reality TV. <laughs> Censor yourself. As I have traveled back and forth across the United States campaigning over the last 18 months, one of the things that has been most striking is the number of Democrats and Republicans who are becoming disillusioned with the status quo. City after city, I have non-libertarians coming up to me asking me what they can do to change things. And after I explain the libertarian platform to them, they go, well, of course. That's exactly what we think the United States should be. Out of all the possible voters, the people who are eligible to vote, sadly, only 20 to 25 percent actually take the time to go to the polls. That leaves 75 percent of the people who are unwilling to vote for the lesser of two evils. If we can get the libertarian message out there, we can take that 75 percent and we can make a significant change in government. Help us get that message out to the people. Imagine, people are not volunteering to go to foreign countries and die the way they used to. Imagine that. In World War II, when Americans truly believed in the issue, young men were lying about their age to get into the military early. Americans rallied behind that war. If you cannot get your citizens to rally behind your war, perhaps, just perhaps, it's an un invalid war. <laughs> The United States has far more military than any other country in the world. We have military in 130 countries around the world. 
Instead of doing international offense, perhaps we can bring those soldiers home for Christmas and Thanksgiving and limit them to doing national defense. Congress doesn't seem to know anything about the Constitution, which is their job. How much less do they know about medicine? regulation drives up the cost of producing these drugs. It costs a billion dollars to get a drug from the table, the science table, out to the marketplace. You, the consumers, are ultimately going to pay that price. American drug companies sell those drugs to Canada. And when Americans try to purchase those drugs, drugs at a cheaper price, the FDA says you're not allowed to do that because those drugs aren't safe. If those drugs aren't safe, why did you sell them to Canada? <laughs> Anytime the government does anything, it drives up the cost and it doesn't work. Get the government out of medicine. First of all, the Founding Fathers loathed a democracy, calling it a tyranny of the majority. <laughs> the United States is not a democracy. The United States is a constitutional republic based on private property and individual rights. In the 1860s, we passed the 13th Amendment, which presumably eliminated slavery, and it took well over 100 years to erase the racial hatred between the whites and the blacks. How do the American government think that they can go into another country and override thousands of years of culture? It is not our job to export anything except products and services. <laughs> Very powerful statements made by Michael Badnerick in regards to the role of government, the true history of American democracy and American governmental organization, born out of the uh, Federalist Papers into what then became our constitutional republic. Um, I find the, that last quote very fascinating. I've heard it many times, the tyranny of the majority. I think that's an important distinction to understand of the way the, the founding fathers truly thought about in regards to the juxtaposition of individual liberty to group-based legislation, organization, participation, and group dynamics, and the sort of power play that goes on with that. So they understood the true value comes with the individual itself. Uh, and the Libertarian Party valued that, encapsulated that. Uh, has moved forward, and there have been many different iterations of a lot of these, like th these foundational principles in regards to libertarian ethics, such as uh, you know voluntarists and anarcho-capitalists, and all these different types of like branching off sort of um, philosophies have taken this idea of non-aggression, right? That it really begins with the individual first and foremost. So you have agency and responsibility over yourself first and foremost. And there is a boundary because that is the boundary. The fact that you have agency and responsibility for yourself does not necessarily mean um, uh, that you have the ability, you have the, the it means in fact that, that that boundary, that you have agency and the ability to control your own body does not mean you have the right to control someone else's mind or body. And it's encapsulated obviously in non-aggression principle. I think that's a very important understanding born out of natural law and sort of the highest sort of uh, argumentation of the Enlightenment era that unfortunately also set the foundations for its own destruction, but that's a time for, that's a tale for another time. Um, let's continue forward with this Michael Badnerick tribute because I'm curious to see some of these other clips we have here in regards to how his understanding evolved from 2004, how he involved as an individual in his understanding of the constitutional, constitutional republic that is America and the role of government and how abused, how how abusive it has become from 2004 onwards and his own reflections and understanding of that. 
Uh, and um, Rich has a little, oh, this is interesting. Summoning the spirit of Michael, I see here, Rich. What do you got going there? I owed it to him to put the hat on, <laughs> but I have to wear glasses to read my notes. All right. So celebrating the life of Michael Badnarik. Bad Narc. For 20 years almost, I said it bad Narc, and then I meet the man and it's bad Narc. He likes mm -hmm. it with that AR sound in there. Uh, let's start with John Cleese. John Cleese was talking about serious versus solemn. Solemn means it's kind of humorless, it's dry. We're going to be serious. Michael was a serious guy, but as you heard, as you heard, like he's got a rapier wit. He's got a samurai sensibility about himself. He knows how to talk to an audience or he knew how to talk to an audience, get their attention, make a point, get them to laugh, but also he was serious. He's dead serious the whole time. So we're going to be serious, but that means there's going to be a little comedy. You're going to hear Michael say some outlandish things in some of these clips. Uh, one of the clips we're going to play in a little bit is his 2010 eulogy for the Libertarian Party. For the Libertarian Party, he wrote a eulogy. I thought that was pretty funny. And we do have a message from Michael to read on this broadcast. It's, a, it's not from the great beyond. He wrote it to us ahead of time. And uh, I'm going to be proud to share that. But I wanted to say that Aside from what we take, like, you know, he taught us about the Constitution, taught us about our rights. Those of us who have studied his books, we'll get into those. I'll read you guys some quotes. Um, but he also was like a, a very well-developed alpha male. He was a scuba instructor. He loved scuba diving. He thought of a relaxing time, strapping people to him and jumping out of a, out of a plane as a parachute instructor. Uh, so, you know, he's not your typical marine kind of couch biologist, potato. I believe as well. He's a very cerebral dude. He had yeah. been cerebral since he was a little kid. Uh, he was a computer programmer. He worked at the, uh, the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant, writing the code that automates and runs a nuclear plant. That's a pretty serious responsibility. One of Michael's challenges through life was when you develop an aptitude so high, like there's there's sometimes opportunities when you are forced into doing things to uh, to pay the bills where it's not your highest use of your aptitude. And Michael fluctuated between phases of getting to leverage his brilliance and then having to kind of, you know, muck it along with people who weren't very conscious. And I think that uh, that eventually built up over the years. And for us, the audience, it flourished when he ran for president in 2004 and for about 10 years. He was an outspoken critic of libertarian party politics because he understood libertarian philosophy and he had a love and passion for sailing. I never got to go sailing with him, but we all talked about it with him many times. Um, but a lot of times we just wanted to ask questions about history, the things that brought out his passions. He was very passionate about United States history, our rights versus the privileges that we with our rights give to government. Um, he did not tolerate fools. <laughs> I mean, I remember some of the uh, online discussions we had where somebody would come at him from a very uneducated, kind of ignorant position, and he would be very quick to kind of state his, his premises and back it up with evidence. And then challenge them to to bring another volley, which usually never came. Um, he was an appreciator of the objectivist philosophy, and I remember this because he re he reached out to me when I had come back into the autonomy community many year, a couple of years ago, and regrettably I did not respond to that. It was not in the right mind space because a lot of happens. But um, he appreciated the work and wanted to have a conversation, so I regret that I never took that up up on him but I, did, I became aware that he was an appreciator of you know i ran and leonard peacock and took a lot of like that as a base understanding for at least the philosophical understanding of the underpinnings of where individual rights come from but one he left objective us, reality and he left us and, some artifacts from which we can study things just like that let's go to a uh, book cam here this is his first book it's called good to be king he wrote it in 2004 and if i crack this book open we're going to see not just his inscription, not just his friend, Jimmy Vaughn, who inspired him to run for president. That's uh, Stevie Ray Vaughn's brother. Uh, the contents here, you can see 
Let's just go real quick. Zoom in for you. Ignorance is bliss, but it's still ignorance. Rights versus privileges, individual rights, sovereignty, forms of government, communist manifesto, founding documents and early history, the preamble and fundamental purposes. And then he breaks down the Constitution article by article. This is one of the most succinct, comprehensive, substantial history books. And if it was read by every citizen of this country, the world would be a better place because there'd be a whole lot less criminality, slavery, all the other things that go along with it. I just wanted to show you, not the preface, let's get to the uh, cover page here, that what he was talking about in the debate is almost word for word what he wrote in the book. In fact, I'm not sure if this book was printed before the debate or after it. It was 2004. The debate was 2004. But the verbiage, the examples, everything that you just heard is spelled out to the nth degree in the book. So it's very easy for a novice. Like I gave this to my 14 year old nephew years ago and and he consumed it. I mean, it's pretty easy read. It's an understandable narrative. It is contradictory to what people were like indoctrinated with in school and the media. But if you weren't paying much attention to the school or media, you can get down to the bare facts and understand your rights as a human being and the evolution of the representations of your rights um, through history. And, uh, why you would want to reestablish your connection with your rights today. So if I were to read a quote out of here, uh, let's see. Thomas Jefferson is quoted as saying, here's a good part right here. Thomas Jefferson is quoted as saying, and the country that can preserve the liberties of its rulers uh, are not warned from time to time that that, that this people preserve the spirit of resistance. Let them take arms. Let the tree of liberty be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants, right? This is a quote from Thomas Jefferson. This is not bad and Eric calling for violence or anything like that. Abraham Lincoln said, this country and with its institutions belongs to the people who inhabit it. You get better, better on the screen. Wherever they shall grow weary of the existing government, they can exercise their constitutional right of amending it or their constitutional right to dismember and overthrow it. I wonder if Lincoln said that before or after the Civil War. He also said, quote, our safety, our liberty depends on the preserving of the Constitution of the United States that our father uh, depends upon preserving the Constitution of the United States as our fathers made it inviolate, meaning it couldn't be, it's a dead document. It can't be changed and amended to suit tyrants of the future if you maintain that document. Well, he's saying there's all sorts, it's like overgrown shrubs. Like there was some nicely trimmed shrubs there. It was the constitution, but now there's all these parts of the government that aren't really part of the constitution. It makes it all, all overgrown. And that precipitates tyranny on individuals generation after generation. But wait, there's more. Michael also wrote this book, The Secret to Sovereignty or How to Survive the Second American Revolution. When did he write this? Is this the recent book? Let's see. I think it was... 2012. So in 2012, he's asserting some of uh, the rights and privileges that articulated in the Good to Be King book. And, you know, this is he he sensed that there was a civil war brewing because if people don't know their rights, they're going to be inculcated with tyranny and despotism. But I think his masterpiece is this book, Philosophical Lighthouse, Mm. Reality versus Fantasy, because he's really getting down to the basics. Yeah, this is where you can see the the objectivism shine through. Right. If there's a large part of the audience that can't tell fact from fiction or reality from fantasy, freedom's going to be sunk. You're not going to have civil discourse. You're going to have civil war. And in this book, there's Hmm. a... Uh, you know, a a basic of what we should have learned in school as far as intelligence, reality, words, numbers, logics, uh, logic, and the other aesthetics of a civil society. And it's told in a way such that there is an objective and subjective parallel path that makes sense. So he gives a lot of good examples to break it open. Like chapter six is just on logic. Logic is the beginning of wisdom, not the end. Logic doesn't tell you what the right answer is. Logic only helps you eliminate the wrong answers. <laughs> Logic is not the same thing as rationale. Rationale is identified as a statement of reasons, a string of ideas closely, uh, loosely tied together to generate an excuse for a conclusion that is almost always predetermined. In other words, you decide what answer you want and you connect the dots until you arrive at your answer. A humorous example of this are the commercials recommending that you switch to, from cable to direct TV. So he gives you contemporary examples that he sees in the world. <laughs> 
that demonstrate this. But <clears throat> Gino Denning would call that rationalization. Right. Yeah. Very so, similar. I divide information into four categories. Things I know are true. Things I think are true. Things I think are false. Things I know are false. And then you would even check those because you want to trust but verify even yourself. So he goes through and breaks down a whole bunch of how to think. Because if you can't have how to think, then your actions are going to be out of line. And uh, you're probably going to be violating other people's rights. So learn the foundation of what your rights are. This is the the fundamental book that people would want to be interested in as like a first step. because. Uh, Are we interested in learning about the Constitution? Most people aren't, but they are very interested in what their rights are. What are the boundaries of their freedom? Where do other people's freedom boundaries pick up? What is the space in between? What are we allowed to do? Who gives us permission? Who gives us license? All these sort of good questions should be answered by an adult mind in order to operate uh, non-contradictorily in this reality. So with some of those books now in perspective, let's go back over here. Um, I mentioned that he's an alpha male. Here's an example. 2004, right after that libertarian debate, they select Michael as the libertarian candidate to represent uh, that party and its people for the president of these United States of America. Notice I didn't say the United States of America. He wouldn't like that. Michael would prefer these United States of America. And There's a debate now on the national stage among the different parties, Republican, Democrat, Green Party, Libertarian Party. Michael is going to go to D.C. and he's going to have his time on stage and debate George Bush, uh, John Kerry. These other characters are running for president. So Michael is in D.C. He's with the Libertarian kind of Green Party candidate. And they get arrested. They're not, they're not wanted. They're not needed for that debate. They are actually sought the powers that be sought to take those candidates and keep them off the street until the debate was over. And so Michael spent that evening of the debate in the basement region of the DC police department going through booking and, uh, the lady, you know, that she's like, well, what's your name and what's your occupation? And he says, Michael Badnarik candidate for president of the United States. And she looks up and says, no, really, what, what, what's your occupation? He says, my name's Michael Badnark, and I'm the candidate for president of the United States. And there's a debate going on right now. And what you're doing is illegal. And he reads her the riot act because he knows his rights. And so she takes it up the chain. And before you know it, there's a whole bunch of interested police around him that say, I didn't know that we arrest people who are in the election situation. Isn't that illegal? He's like, yes, isn't this is my point. What you guys are doing is illegal. So he ends up getting out of that situation. They don't get to go to the debate and debate Kerry and Bush and company, but they did hold their own debate. I think across the street is this, is how the story breaks up. So there's uh, another piece of footage from 2004 where it's Michael and the green candidate, and they basically host their own debate across the street. And then they cut it together with the answers that the other people across the street, the official kind of narrative, and they put their answers in there. And, and that was a piece of footage that uh, was floating around back then. So it's interesting that even in the situation where it's like your persona non grata, he's like, I don't care. I'm here. I'm going anyway. I'm going to, sp- I'm going to speak my piece. He's going to not be, uh, he's not going to have his freedom infringed very easily. So coming up to like the, uh, the pandemic, People are like, Michael, they're trying to do these mandated vaccinations. What's what's your advice? And he says something to the effect of, he's like, well, I just, I tell them they can do what they want. You can bring your needle and I'll bring my 45 and we'll see who makes a bigger hole. And that really gets people to raise their eyebrows and be like, whoa, whoa. But he's serious about his bodily sovereignty. He's serious about his self-defense. And he was 68 or 67, probably around that time, maybe 66. Anyway, he was at the point where he's old enough not to give a fuck. He's going to say what he wants. He's going to do what he wants. He's a man. He has fully adulted. He has not experienced uh, extended adolescence in any way, shape, or form, and doesn't tolerate the fools who are in that situation very easily, as as I said. He had a heart attack in 2009, and right after that, he did, I think it was one of his first public appearances, Uh, He did the eulogy 
for the Libertarian Party. Now, the Libertarian Party in 2010, they didn't call Michael and say, hey, will you come to our conference and give us a eulogy and tell people our party is dead? No, no. They just said, hey, this guy ran for our party in 2004. He'd be a great speaker. Invite him to the conference. So I think the audience is probably taken aback a little bit with what Michael had to say. And uh, Justin, if you have that clip from the 2010, because I also watched the 2011, he's got a lot of great talks out there on YouTube, but I just wanted to pick some of the uh, the more prolific ones that showed his best character and who he was as a, as a person and uh, that demonstrated his uncompromising values. So let's go ahead to that, uh, him reading the eulogy at 2010 Libertarian Convention. He's back. Doing it politely. 
instead of respectfully agreeing to disagree, you resort to rude ad hominem attacks, accusing anyone who doesn't share your view of being a socialist. Why would, why would anyone want to join this family when we are so completely dysfunctional? Never argue with a libertarian fool, because people can't tell the difference. <laughs> Libertarians proudly advertise themselves as the party of principle, but saying it doesn't make it so. When Ron Paul announced his presidential campaign in 2007, many libertarians complained that he would steal votes that belonged to the Libertarian Party. When I endorsed Ron's candidacy, I was accused of abandoning the Libertarian Party and becoming a Republican. I didn't abandon the Libertarian Party. A significant percentage of the Libertarian Party abandoned the principle of liberty. Libertarians as a whole are lazy. They're always looking for a shortcut. They're always looking for a silver bullet. In the 2008, uh, the 2008 membership nominated the candidate with the highest celebrity status, apparently on the assumption that after several television appearances, Americans would suddenly understand the principles of liberty, party membership would skyrocket, and we'd all live happily ever after. There is no silver bullet. The only way to restore our constitutional republic is to work 18, 20 hours a day promoting the cause of liberty. Needless to say, very few of us are willing to put in that kind of effort. I guess that we are fortunate that libertarians have all the answers. I know this to be true because so many of you came up to me after my presidential nomination to tell me, Michael, all you got to do to win the election is fill in the blank. Everybody knows what they want the other guy to do for liberty. Do it yourself! chiefs and not enough Indians. If you have a great idea, find the resources and the volunteers to make it happen. Tell me about it after you've been successful. Stop telling me what I ought to do. I don't get enough sleep the way it is. So here is the bottom line. The Libertarian Party is an endangered species. Unless you dramatically change the way that you do things, the party will soon be extinct. If you really want to save the party and restore freedom, I have a few suggestions. Establish a dress code. <laughs> If you want to be a major league player, you gotta wear the uniform. No t-shirts, no shorts or blue jeans, no flip-flops. Jackets and ties for the men, skirts and slacks for women, okay? Pretend you're going to the prom. Eliminate paper candles, okay? If, you, if you're not going to run to win, then stay at home. Or better yet, volunteer for a candidate who is committed to going all the way. It's an interesting response by Badnark. Um, on one level, obviously, he's using sarcasm and satire in order to criticize what the Libertarian Party had evolved or devolved into. Certainly, that's conspicuous. But on another hand, I think he's quietly sort of reproaching kindly in a way and as kind as michael badnar can are approaching the libertarian party saying you still have time to change this is a call to action because and really what he's telling people uh in a roundabout way is you have to look to at your own actions your own behavior your own responsibility because the way you're behaving the way you're reacting or acting or reacting is exactly what our political opponents are doing so in other words we're uh we're embodying the worst elements of what we're essentially trying to argue against and go against the foundational principles of libertarian philosophy. And so it, I saw two sort of elements 
coexist at the same time, sort of uh, contemporaneously in regards to on one level, he's clearly in Michael Badneric sort of sardonic way, criticizing the Libertarian Party while at the same time, giving a sense of hopefulness and the ability to still turn inwards and change oneself, maybe change the, the direction of the party that obviously never came to fruition. But I, I appreciate his uh, very unique rhetorical attempt. There. Well, he had to be candid with them um, to get the oh, message yeah. across because like... <clears throat> But he did so in a very there's, unique way. There's which a saying, is like it's good. like, um, your friends like you how you are. I like you too much to leave you how you are. Like you're making a mistake. You need to be given some advice. So he gave them some tough love. Sure. Yeah. They didn't really learn from that tough love. The no. words went unheard. Because <laughs> what happens in the years after that was a history of the Libertarian Party even getting more volatile and like infighting. And he's right. 98%, they all agree, but they spend all their time fighting about that 2%. My last episode of Peace Revolution podcast was episode 93. We're in episode 93 of Grand Theft World. Don't get panicked. Don't don't get nervous here. Uh, I did that last episode because it was the history of libertarian philosophy and its intersection with politics and how there's a, kind of a, a corruption there. The libertarian philosophy does not flow down to the party for the past 20 years. Yeah, And so the end of peace revolution 93 ends with like uh, the former libertarian party president, Nick Sarwark, um, who was kind of like, you know, with the Koch brothers and there was a whole bunch of shenanigans going on. Right. So sure, yeah. I moved to do the next episode of peace revolution episode 94, because it is still a live podcast. There are more episodes of that in the future. Episode 94 is on specifically libertarian philosophy and practical applications in reality. Now, I wasn't just doing the episode to say, here's some practical applications. I was also working on a practical application of libertarian philosophy when I launched the autonomy course in 2019. We were six weeks into that course when one of the students said to me, you know who could really use this course? I said, no, who? He said, Michael Badnarik. Only it was in text. So I read it as Badnarik. And I was like, well, why do you think, you know, and he would need this and how do you know him and are you friends and how close? And he's like, he's stayed at my house before we're friends. And so I reached out to Michael and we started talking. So that's the first time I actually got to talk to the guy after 20 years of, you know, being a student of his philosophy, I actually get to talk to the guy and provide service because he needed some stuff, right? He, he made that comment about how libertarians couldn't sell ice water in the desert. Yeah, that was brilliant. I There's got a, a lot of people out, of out there yeah. who are struggling because they have an aversion to sales and marketing because they never learned the real way to do they it. They have an aversion to speaking to other people. They've only seen the cringeworthy way to do it, and they don't want to be cringeworthy, and I understand that. But there is a problem to be solved, and for Michael, what we did was, first off, we got him involved, and we got him talking to more people, and that raised his spirits right away. And then we helped him market his books. And then we said, Michael, you've got this brilliance about the Constitution. Can we help you make a course on the Constitution? And his excuse, because Michael was a good one on the excuses when it comes to sales and marketing of anything doing that had to do with Michael. And I said, that's your root cause problem. I was trying to help him with them. And he says, well, I did a Constitution class 20 years ago. It's an eight-hour class. And somebody put it on Google video. And now it's out there. So he didn't think he had any value to bring. Because somebody took his work from 20 years ago and put it out there. And he's like, anyone who wants to see it can go see it in 10 minute chunks on YouTube. It's there right now. I can't take it down. I said, Michael, the people we're talking about in the audience that would buy this course, they don't care about that. They want Michael in 2019. They want to know what you think about these situations. They want to ask questions and get their answers from you directly. They don't want to watch a YouTube video from 20 years ago. So we convinced them that there was value in that. And for us, it was a really priceless experience because we got to have him unfold his whole course as he desired and the the segments that he wanted, you know, he wanted to do it not all at once. So let's meet once a week. He'll do two lectures and we'll have a Q&A. It's interactive. And that was a really grow. It was a really good growing experience for him. Um, probably a month or so later, Red Pill Expo was being uh, hosted here in Hartford, we wanted to see Michael and meet him in person. So we flew him up here. He spoke at Red Pill. We all had a great time. He got to, you know, have dinner in my dining room upstairs with all my friends. It was a really precious life moment. And from there, I think he gained some more momentum. He was doing a couple more speaking engagements. But, you know, that 2009 heart attack 
he never kind of outpaced that. He's known from for years he needed a heart replacement. He wasn't a good candidate for heart transplant. And um the the conge- the conjunctive heart failure situation that he's had uh got worse in the last couple months. And that's why we're having this tribute and this celebration of his life tonight. Before he got into the hospital situation recently, he was uh, a tour guide at the Alamo. Now, Michael's from Indiana. He ended up moving to Texas. Um, he had a passion for the Alamo for years and years and years. And then only you know recently did it fall into his lap that he could have a job there as a tour guide. So in his later days, he was doing things that he was love. He was passionate about sharing his knowledge for, for history with younger generations. And he got to do that with people who came through the Alamo looking for the best tour guide for such a thing. And for a short time, they had the chance to walk around and get to hear the stories uh, from his perspective. So um, we have a couple more pieces to unfold here. I wanted to go to Michael had a mailing list because we helped him set up a mailing list so he could communicate with his audience more clearly. And he writes some epic emails. And he tells you really good, interesting stories. So every time you get an email from Michael Badnerick, you're clicking it to see what's the crazy story this time and what kind of lesson is there going to be embedded in the story. And he was thoughtful enough before he passed that he wrote uh, his last entry. He wrote his own eulogy. Here we have a picture of Michael at his 68th birthday party on August 6th. He had a full house of visitors and stayed true to the planned party from 12 p.m. until 12 a.m. in true Michael fashion. It was just so fun being me. It's something I will never forget him saying about his amazing life. And this is from Michael. So long, farewell, Alfie to Shane, good night. My name is Michael Bednarik, and apparently I am dead. I'm not communicating with you from the great beyond. I merely had the foresight to write this while I was still viable consciousness, and I asked a friend of mine to post this to my website for me after I was gone. This gives me the opportunity to write my own eulogy. If you knew me while I was still warm, you probably noticed that I lived my life by my rules and never allowed someone else to dictate what my values were going to be. Now would be a good time to cue Frank Sinatra's I Did It My Way, which I frequently sang in the shower. It disappoints me to think that this quality made me so unique. I encourage everyone to stop being so submissive, especially to nonsensical government edicts. In short, Grow up and grow a pair. The things that I hope I am remembered for are my honesty and integrity. I often told people, don't ask questions that you don't want the answers to. It never helps anything to be in denial. My father was a role model for integrity, and my experience in scouts reinforced the idea that a truly good and respectable man was someone who was trustworthy. I tried very hard never to make promises I couldn't keep, and I definitely never made any idle threats. Most people could tell by the look in my eyes that I was more than willing to carry out the negative reinforcement that I was promising. From an early age, my life was one adventure after another. Scuba diving, sailing, mountain climbing, whitewater canoeing, and rafting. Don't forget skydiving, but that came later. I was lucky enough to go through life without much fear of anything. Keep in mind that fear is a symptom of ignorance. If you are afraid, the simple solution is to learn as much as you can about that subject. When you know what you are doing, the fear simply goes away. Michael Badnarik. Sage wisdom from a mind who spent a lot of time thinking. Asking questions, finding real answers, challenging ignorance on a regular basis. When was the last time you challenged ignorance? Your own ignorance, someone else's ignorance. If the world is such that we are not putting ignorance in check within our own minds or within our reality or other people's claims, you're going to get what we have here outside. Almost civil war. People can't communicate. Chasm getting bigger and bigger between those groups volatile, more extremist actions are being taken on both sides. It seems like not the exact replay of the Civil War in 1861, but it's like the second verse. It rhymes and it's in the same tempo 
And it's in the same timing. And it's the same sort of constrictions on people's rights, the same sort of censorship, the same sort of deleterious erosion of all things that support the structure of liberty and freedom that a lot of us have grown up appreciating or not appreciating. We have been, for the better part of human history, some of the luckiest people to ever set foot on this earth as far as the the things that we have uh, that other people before us didn't have. Many of us have clean water. We have sewage and plumbing, roofs over our head, food that's not growing uh, or made out of mold or insects yet. But we're, you know, we're, it's a it's a precipice that we're on here with freedom and liberty. And Michael has passed the torch. That was the symbol for his website, michaelbadnark.com. You see the torch of liberty. He has passed that on, not just to me, but to you and everyone else. Because if we don't take it upon ourselves to at least learn what's in one book, which represents the whole basis of our own government, are we fit to criticize the government? Are we fit to challenge these other ideas? Because there is an interesting part. Let's cut to one of his books. There was a part I remember in Michael's book where he talked about Kant. You know Kant, Tony? Yes, Emmanuel I know Emmanuel Kant. Kant. Some people yes, pronounce indeed. it Kant, but um, that's not what we say here on this show. We call Kant. Kant. Let's go to uh, the book camp. This is Michael Badnarik's Philosophical Lighthouse, right? If you are in the fog of war, you're looking for that lighthouse. Where is fact versus fiction? the rocks versus the ocean. You got to learn to discern. So let's break in here. This is page 84. Rearrange a couple things here. Immanuel Kant, 1724 to 1804, was a German philosopher who postulated that reality does not exist. And even if it does exist, there is no way to get any direct evidence of reality. His conclusion was that absent any evidence, <clears throat> your reality and my reality were merely subjective observations that appeared to be reality. Therefore, both versions of reality were equally valid, Tony. So no one's reality is right and no one's really wrong. Which no. violates the law of con non-contradiction, which then violates the law of identity. He's classic with that. Yeah. Because metaphysics is the axiom of every philosophy, we can restate Kant's conclusion another way. No one's philosophy is right and no one's philosophy is wrong. This statement, if you believe it, will box in uh, you into an intellectual corner. You will be forced to modify your current philosophy, or you will be forced to admit that you don't accept the existence of reality or the laws of physics. So then he breaks into reality or mysticism. This is a binary choice. The laws of physics are immutable, or they're not. It cannot be true and false at the same time in the same way. A coin cannot be heads and tails at the same time. It doesn't make sense to say the laws of physics are immutable some of the time. Reality or mysticism. These are the two options for your metaphysics. Of the two, only reality requires consistent philosophy in order to accurately discover where reality begins and ends. If your metaphysics relies on mysticism, then it doesn't matter whether reality exists or not. It can be changed. All it takes is the right magic, amount of magic and sorcery. So he goes on, but he makes really sad. And that's sort points. of a recapitulation of a lot of Peikoff's points, which you know, obviously, yeah, Aristotle, like Aristotle most certainly to a certain to, to a certain extent. Which obviously Peikoff was, you know, the objectivist philosophy is sort of it's the 20th century sort of repackaging, rebranding of Aristotelian philosophy, um, and you know, with the basis of reality and uh, empiricism at the heart of it and the, the importance of using our mind to discover the laws of nature and the things that exist within uh, reality. Well, and that's what he loved. He loved science. He loved that. He's a yeah. guy who's he was like, a marine he's biologist buying telescopes. And he's helping. He got hired as consultants to help grandfathers buy microscope for their granddaughter or a father by a telescope for the son. Like people would just call him up yeah. and be like, hey, and he would know or become knowledgeable rapidly on any of these given topics. Very and he smart. loved using his brain. He loved using his brain for the the purpose that nature made it. Yeah. To ask absolutely. questions, to find answers and let other people know in the form of story, narrative, what have you, communicate it to other people. Knowledge becomes wisdom only when shared. He was into sharing it. I think for a little while for the autonomy community. Um, he was doing some presentations in going for very long, but I think I call one on 
some of his understandings in marine biology. And, oh, yeah. Uh, we would let him. He, yeah, he had the floor. He, Anytime he I had appreciated an idea, his like, Michael, rough. come on and talk about whatever. And he'd be like, Tuesday night, we're going to talk about, you know, uh, aquatic animals and the coral reef or whatever his interest was at that particular time. So a prolific learner is yeah. always an interesting person to talk to. And you didn't have to ask him too much to get your sermon out of him. What has he learned up to oh, this yeah. point in his life? And he was happy to share it. That's why he was such a great teacher. Yeah. He's curious about other people. He was he's open-minded, but he, his mind closes when it reaches the point of reality and you can yeah. find your way to the conclusion and decision because that's how you move on in the world and don't get stuck in that's a That's how you can hole. take action in the world by knowing the world in which you exist. And he was adamant about this. He was very um, keen on metaphysics and the idea of reality existing and that there are laws to reality and that there's... Um, uh, natures to things. In other words, it's the cause and effect to the things that exist. And we can understand that we can experience it. We can describe it with our language and sometimes modify it, change it, you know, understand it. And he was really big on that. And every, anytime I had an interaction with him, he really reiterated that. And I understood for good reason, because so much of our world is caught up in this sort of quasi sort of mystical slash subjectivist reality or viewpoint of reality, which leads to sort of, you know, nihilism, relativism, Oh, host of sort of reductio out of certums and epistemology and metaphysics, which just means it leads to um, situations that uh, throw reality away for one's subjective fantasies. And the problem is then one can't take action because you're creating the whole thing in your mind. So why take action if I'm the one doing it by pure abstraction? So he was really, he really fought against a lot of the pseudoscientific claims out there. I don't know how many times I've heard him rant. And I loved it because I always got a kick out of it because I, I agreed with him and I had similar altercations, interactions. If you only knew about some of the altercations, interactions I've had since COVID, you get a good kick out of that. But his, his you know, um, uh, willing to debate sometimes uh, flat earth and really the really ridiculous sort of conspiracies out there and hearing him sort of bring it up and get into it. No, Always you to him, you're going to end up got... having to go out and do some experiments because he's not oh, going to just do yeah. this back and forth bullshit that a lot of people want to engage in because he doesn't want to waste your time or his. No. Right. He's a true empiricist. So again, he was a true empiricist. That not dude suffering is... fools lightly allows you to save uh -huh. a lot of time. A um, couple other things. Uh, Justin from the production chat, will you, pull up the the picture of uh michael the group photo with me and joshua and polly and lucas with uh with michael i wanted to just make a note of that because that's uh it's part of the reason i'm wearing the hat this this man michael unless you, there was a rule where he had to get rid of that cowboy hat like the, the libertarian videos we watched he didn't have the cowboy hat on but just about everywhere else you see the cowboy hat with michael there he is and then um he he outlived his dad by I think two or three years. His dad passed away a couple of years ago. When his dad passed, Michael got a, a small inheritance, and Michael invested that inheritance in a Hemi, and he loved to drive that. Uh, I don't know if it was a Charger or a Challenger, but he had himself a Hemi, and then he got himself a job working security, probably twenty or thirty minutes from where he lived specifically so he could go drive his car because otherwise he didn't have a purpose <laughs> to drive. So he, he purposely got some employment far enough away where he's like 20 or 30 minutes of that, you know, Hemi vibrating. He's like, it's very therapeutic and it really gave him a lot of vitality. And, um, That's good. you know, so it's not about the superficial thing when you're buying a car, but sometimes it is about the experience. It's, sometimes it's about the vitality and uh, being an alpha male, he was exuberantly, uh, engaging in lead footing his way around Texas, any place he had to go, the further, the better. And uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's just another part. That's Michael. Uh, it's consistent with his personality. Yeah, it's consistent with him. Yeah. And in any of these situations, there's, there's always two different kind of burdens that comes with losing a mentor like that. Um, it's the loss of access, immediate access. I can't just call him or text them. We've spent a lot of time on the phone with him over the years and specifically over the last like month or so, Lisa has spent hours and hours with him on the phone and Lucas sang him happy birthday. There was a lot of great things that happened, but now, I mean, I really, first off, personally, candidly, I didn't think he's going to die right after his birthday party. Like I got a, 
when he was in the yeah, hospital. Yeah, I'm surprised by this as well. I called a buddy of mine who's a doctor. I said, will you talk to him and, and see what the situation is? And I got a good report back that he could be still living for quite a while. And when I got news that he passed, it's like, oh, man. Like, again, I didn't believe him and he was right. Because he said to Lisa last week, he's like, Lisa, I'm dying. And she was trying, and he's like, no, I'm dying. And he was very forthright about his situation. And I mean, it was probably two weeks ago at this point, but. I remember we talked about it and the takeaway I got having no interaction with him, um, just through, except through you guys, um, was that a lot of it had, I mean, I don't want to, I mean, he had a, it's tough to go through a chronic situation like that. And oh, one's sure. sort of, you know, mental disposition sort of can deteriorate and around that. Plus, so look I know at the world decaying around him. Yeah. Like, you know, he was hard. really, he, he kind of died mm-hmm. from a broken heart syndrome. Yeah. A little bit too. Because his love That's for freedom, I, I don't think was reflected back enough that he understood that people really understood what he was saying and were taking it seriously. He didn't get enough of that reflection back. I kept telling him, Hey, you've broken influenced spirit. the past 20, 20 years of my life. And he said that running for libertarian candidate for president was the worst thing he ever did in his life. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, in wow. those situations, that's it's tough. And he's not the only one who's gone through that. I've seen any number of older gentlemen yeah. who have gone through that situation. Where Lost the world to live. Yeah. I mean, people I hate to say it's what don't happened. hear their message until after they're gone. Yeah. And that's very discouraging to them in their, their later years. That being said, his optimism in the years when he had it, when shared properly, has effects that go on far beyond today. And that are very much an inspiration in a, a lot of what we do. So he's not here anymore. Can't ask him questions on the fly. But we also have to accept that responsibility. He's not here anymore. We need to keep the information that he purveyed selflessly. We need to keep that alive. We need to keep it in use. We need to keep it activated. And we need to keep it around, close. Just like the tools to control the fireplace. You don't want mm-hmm. those tools on the other side of the house. The log rolled out. We got to pick it up, put it back in. We need to know how to do these basic motions. Otherwise, the whole house is going to burn down. I think that's what he would want the most. I mean, we, we lose two things. We, we lose instant access, obviously, to Michael, which is tragic in and of itself. We also lose uh, his mind. Um, the dude was an autodidact. He is an incredibly intelligent individual, extremely wise. He understood literature. He understood history. He understood philosophy. It, he was he in many ways human action was, and behavior. Too. Yeah, in many different domains, in all all the varying domains of human experience. I mean, he was very well rounded. He wasn't just um, you know the scientist empiricist sort of dude. Like he was a very intelligent, very well rounded individual. So losing that, I think it, and again, the, the idea of passing the liberty torch, not only with understanding the history of our constitutional republic, but even understanding like the intellectual torch. Like the idea, reason why I teach the trivium when I got in, uh, uh, when I met Gino Denning and started that whole process. And I keep thinking because some of they share so much of a likeness to one another in regards to individual rights and freedom. Very complimentary and intellects in the battle for maintaining freedom yeah. and retaining freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, when I look back on that, I, I really encourage, I mean, the, when Gina was teaching me, the, the key was, for you to use this, for you to learn for yourself, how to learn anything for yourself. Um, it's not for me to teach you. And I was immortalized in an email I shared with Gene where I kept asking him questions. And he, you can, if you act fast, you can get a set of uh, Japanese Ginzu knives, only twenty nine ninety nine. dollars is, you know, uh, sarcastic way of being like, okay, okay, you need to do your own research. You need to come up to your own conclusions. Yeah, you need to have the confidence to know you, you can talk about that without having me do it for you. And that's right. very much, that's Gene, but m- so much of G- Michael is very much, just reminds me so much of that disposition, that, that, that willingness to be like tough love. The world is harsh. There's a lot of suffering and you have to rise above. You are going to have to stand on your own two feet, rise above and embody that and make something better from it. And, you know, that's an important message. And hopefully as tragic as this passing is that people maybe over time continue to, will find ways to rediscover the torch of liberty, preserve it in whatever fashion we can. And then at one point when it's possible, maybe it will be, uh, the conditions will be right for it to burn wildly once again. So in an effort to make this serious, but not solemn, 
let's look at it like this. What's the best thing we could do to honor Michael's memory tonight or for the next couple of weeks? What's the next, what's the thing we could do? Go to the drive, go to the shooting We can range. all learn. Well, besides going to the firing range, he's a big <laughs> second amendment advocate. Oh man. Was he? He, he had always got, those pictures. I never got to go to the range with Michael because COVID started. He was going to come up here and we we're going to go. But um, I have a lot of friends and uh, co-workers who did get to go to the range with Michael and have oh, that's cool. really good nice. memories of that. Uh, yeah, big Second Amendment advocate. But um, I was going to say, I think the best thing we could do is study our rights. What are our rights? Let's let's really get honed in on those boundaries. Where are our rights? How's the government supposed to work? What is done right look like? And then we can start comparing and contrasting and communicating more clearly with others. So Michael did uh, his 2019 presentation of his constitutional course with the question and answer sessions. He was selling that on uh, his site and the Autonomy Agora Marketplace. I think it was 200 bucks. I would like for the next month to make an agreement with the audience. I would like to give that very much to you for free for the next month. I would think that in acceptance of that offer, you'll dedicate some time in your schedule, a couple hours a week to internalize that information before one month is up. Because after a month, I think we're going to reattach the price to it. And we're going to send that money to Tisha, who's going to continue to publish his books, maintain his website. And we want to make sure that information continues into the future. But I think we need more representatives of that information itself. Become an evangelist of the constitution of your rights. Let other people in your family know from a relevant source. You don't have to communicate it to them directly. You can point them to it and they can watch it for free for the next month, just like you can. This is something that we can internalize together, decentralized, have common talking points for our friends, family, neighbors, coworkers, and get on the same page before they throw all this crazy 2022 election at us and all the other FBI shenanigans that are going to go on in the next couple of months. So they say it's going to be, oh, it's going to be a cold winter, dark winter, all these types of things. Let's prepare for winter. I think the way we're going to keep ourselves warm is not by setting fires out there like Antifa does. I think we need to set brush fires of the mind within the fires ourselves in the first. minds of men. Fire in the minds of men. You've heard me talk about that book <laughs> ad nauseum for two years now. We're bringing it into play. You need to know yourself. You need to know what your rights are. You need to be able to communicate and articulate this information cogently to other people quickly. Michael made a course to do that. Now, he didn't go out and do interviews and radio and TV and all these things, advertisements, commercials to get people to see his course because he had that. I don't think I'm important enough to push my product. I don't believe in my product enough to get out there and do the sales and marketing. He had those internal hangups. Are we going to let those internal hangups that are no longer part of this world? He's passed. Are we going to let those prevent the rest of us from having to do what we do uh, need to do to maintain and retain freedom for ourselves and our families in the future? I think we should embrace this opportunity. Michael has left us options and opportunity to learn our way out of this. And I think the world would be a better place if everybody who's watching right now went to, what's the URL? Marketplace.autonomyagora.com and click to get it for free. We've been right, showcasing go. this Justin's got it up on screen. site on the stream, marketplace.autonomyagora.com. And of course, links in the show notes. All right. And you guys can verify if you click to sign up, it doesn't charge you $197. You should be able to get it for free. And if you had uh, questions, comments, concerns, you can ask in the Grand Theft World community, use the, uh, the support in the uh, community there, and we'll sort that out in the next 24 hours before we post this uh, as the replay. That makes sense? Good. All right. So for our last piece of this tribute tonight, we have Daniel Humbert thoughtfully took selected pieces of Michael's larger interviews and public speaking engagements and composed them into a nice memorial video, uh, some touching photos at the end that I thought were very appropriate because Michael, he was a unique guy and you get to see it in some of those photos. It's not all dry constitutional libertarian type stuff. He he's a, a, a well-balanced, well-developed example of what an intellect can do over 68 years. So let's go ahead and uh, roll Daniel's piece. And then after that, we'll again uh, show the webpage so people can get his course for free. (laughs) 
I ask you, who owns your body? I mean, most people react as if it's a nonsense question. Of course, of course I own my own body. Well, unfortunately, that's not the way this country started out. When we signed the Declaration of Independence, it said all men are created equal. Women were not allowed to vote. Women were not allowed to own property. And even more embarrassing to our American history, if you were black, you were considered property. Fortunately, we have become greatly enlightened from that point, and most people in the United States no longer hold that view. We understand that it is morally reprehensible to even assert that you own another person's body. Quickly, but this is, again, only an introduction, but it's an important foundation. Even those of you that are talking about, the, you know, really important issues, maybe a little bit more sophisticated issues, it's always good to go back and reestablish what your foundation is, and then it makes your high-level arguments just that much more secure. Now, before I you know, even started the class, I've had several people point out to me that the flag is upside down. I am a lot of things. Dyslexic is not one of them. <laughs> Anybody have any idea why the flag is upside down? Yes, it is a, it's a distress signal and it's an emergency, a sign of emergency. I have the flag upside down deliberately because from my point of view, the United States is definitely in dire trouble. And the trouble stems from the fact that people living here in the United States have no idea what type of government they have. They don't know the difference between a democracy and a republic. They don't know what their rights are. Another person that you have heard of, I'm sure, is Daniel Webster. And Daniel says, I apprehend no danger to our country from a foreign foe. Our destruction, should it come at all, will be from another quarter, from the inattention of the people to the concerns of their government. From their carelessness and negligence, I must confess that I do apprehend some danger. I fear that they may place too implicit a confidence in their public servants and fail properly to scrutinize their conduct. That in this way they may be made the dupes of designing men and become the instruments of their own undoing. Make them intelligent and they will be vigilant. Give them the means of detecting the wrong and they will apply the remedy. So my purpose here is to try to make you intelligent. I'm not going to tell you what to do or which congressman to write to. I'm just going to take the Constitution and show you what the Constitution says. I will ask you to read it for yourself. And then when you sit there somewhat shocked and stunned, then you can decide how to fix the problem. Now, many of you have never met me. Some of you have seen me give a, a short presentation before. Let me tell you up front that I am an iconoclast. Now, an iconoclast is defined as a breaker or destroyer of images, one who attacks cherished beliefs and traditional institutions as being based on error or superstition. Unfortunately, most of what you think you know about the United States is wrong. Does it make sense that our American government has the authority to violate the Constitution? Do they have the authority to just add power? Can Supreme Court judges say, well, we're going to do this now? Can the President of the United States say, well, you know, I really haven't been busy enough, and so I'm going to assume the authority to write executive orders and make law for 300 million Americans? Does that sound constitutional to you? It's not. Most of what your government does is unconstitutional. These are your rights that the government is violating. They're putting them in paper. And we, the people, are allowing it to happen. I'm not happy about that. I want to change what my government is doing. I want to limit 
the power of my elected officials. The Constitution is only a piece of paper. The only thing that gives the Constitution any strength, any authority, is we the people. Everybody wants liberty. Everybody wants their individual rights. Where does liberty live? Does liberty live in the Declaration of Independence? Does it live in the Constitution? Where does liberty live? Lives in your heart. It's in here. Thomas Jefferson said, you only have the rights that you are willing to fight for. Do I have freedom of speech because somebody wrote the First Amendment back in 1791? No. I have freedom of speech because the government's not big enough to shut me up. I am one of we the people. The government works for me. I am hoping, I am hoping that liberty lives in your heart. You and I are the ones that have the responsibility of confining government power, of reining in their authority, telling them what they can or cannot do. And just because they've written a piece of paper, just because a bunch of guys in jackets and ties have signed it, null and void. It's repugnant to the Constitution. And it doesn't mean anything. It only means what we the people allow it to mean. The only legitimate government exists to protect our lives, our liberty, and our private property. The United States is not a democracy, in spite of the fact that every president since Woodrow Wilson has stepped up to a microphone to announce that we want to make the world safe for democracy. When people ask me if I think that guns are dangerous, I say, no, I, if I thought guns were dangerous, I wouldn't have several of them. And then the next question was, well, couldn't we vote to take your guns away? And I admit that, yes, that you could take a vote, a unanimous vote that, you know, I'm crazy or dangerous and that you'd like to, you know, take my guns away. But my right to keep and bear arms is not subject to a vote. And so if you vote to take my guns away from me, you're going to have to take another vote to see which one of you is going to come and take them because I am going to resist. It is not your decision as to whether or not I am authorized to protect my life or the lives of my family. The difference between a right and a privilege, this is so fundamentally important. I teach an eight hour class on the Constitution and this is the, the fulcrum of the class. This is the axiom. I believe that all, all of our political problems in the United States are based on the fact that Americans do not understand the difference between rights and privileges. Your rights are in every molecule of your body. They, they are, you are born with your rights. No one can take your rights away. And you are, it's impossible for you to give your rights away any more than it's possible for you to put your your nightmares into a paper bag and give them to some of your friends who are braver than you are. You can't give your dreams away. You can't give your rights away. They are inherent. And I really, I hate the phrase constitutional rights because it makes people believe that your rights are granted to you by the Constitution. And that's not true. If you believe that the Constitution gives you your rights, then it can be easily argued that the Constitution can take them away. It is not the Constitution's job to protect us. It is our job to protect the Constitution. And in order to do that, we must love liberty. We must love freedom. That fire, that passion has to exist in our hearts. And my purpose in life is to inspire people to share and understand that same burning passion for liberty that I have and that the founding fathers had. It only takes one match to start a forest fire. You know, these are the fires 
of liberty. And everybody that I talk to will hopefully become inspired and they will become inspired to inspire others, that they will talk to their friends, their family, their co-workers and share that passion for liberty and continue the message and so on and so on. It is that passion for liberty, that political discourse which brings these issues to mind and makes the United States a better place. So whether or not you see things as the way they should be right now, the universe is unfolding the way that it is supposed to and people are continuing to light the fires of liberty and I'm very, very optimistic for the future. In memory of Michael, carry on the torch of freedom. Light the fire of liberty inside of you. Learn your rights and how to defend them. You can find Michael's course at the Autonomy Agora Marketplace, where you can also discover the essentials of liberty in every aspect of your life with autonomy, a 12-week course giving you a skeleton key for living. Links in the description. I thought I was going to get through that without getting teared up. What would Michael say about mm -hmm. a man getting <laughs> teared up over another man like that? <laughs> Let me say this. No, I feel I, you, man. I was <laughs> since I heard him back in 2004. I have carried this in my pocket when I go outside. Let's see. There we go. Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States of America. Now, can't get the color to stay on that. It's a burgundy book. It's a little pocket book. Let me show you. You can fit here instead of having a pocket square. You can roll with the Constitution in your pocket and let people know, uh, you know, their rights. There might be a situation someplace. There's an altercation. Some people arguing at the store. Break out a common document. Distract them from the heated moment and maybe get something done. You can walk around. People walk around with lots of books. Some people walk around the Bible. I find it hard to put in pocket, but this little baby, this tells you your rights, reminds you of your rights, could help you in other situations, it helps keep your rights kind of like right here next to your heart where they should be. Liberty lives in your heart. And I think that's a great lesson that Michael taught all of us. I think his inspiration and uh, vitality in those clips was shared with plenty of people. I know so many people in the Liberty Movement um, who were part of Michael's life. And he had a long history with uh, with the Libertarian Party, Libertarian politics, Libertarian philosophy, well before we got to know him over here on the autonomy side. So uh, he touched a lot of students' lives through the course over the years. He wasn't just in season one. He was recurring for several seasons and shared a lot more of his wisdom than I think he would have than if he didn't get in with some other people who could help him move the ball forward. You know, entrepreneurs, they wear plenty of hats. But when you're somebody like Michael, he's not even trying to be an entrepreneur. He's just trying to get a message to market that saves lives. But in the midst of trying to do that, he had to have a website. He had to create these other elements and he needed help with that. So I'm proud that we were able to, at the time when he needed it, provide that help because I sat by for so many years before we had these resources and I had to watch people who could have used help and we didn't have organized help. So, uh, Toughen up. All right. So, sorry. Michael has passed, but his memory is still going to be with us. 
and the way we can keep his memory alive in the best way possible, I think, the, to respect his memory is to learn our rights, to keep liberty close to your heart and share it with those who are important in your life. What makes the Grand Theft World podcast unique, invigorating, exciting, and informative? Most other podcasts out there are either doing straight up interviews or they're just covering the daily news. They're covering current events from the day they happen. And that is effective. It's useful. It's a great starting point. And then sometimes these current events change during the week past the first story. So we like to give it a little time. You have to wait till some of the dust settles on these stories in order to give them accurate coverage. And the other thing that's really missing in the media landscape is covering the articles that are coming out every day. That's great. That's necessary. But who's bringing in contextual history so that you can understand what has been going on for decades and decades to lead up to the machinations and actions that we see unfolding today. So what we do here on the podcast is we cover current events. Many of these things are censored, but we wait about a week. As a forensic historian, I focused mainly through my career on the history of globalism and collectivism and things that they call maybe the new world order. There's a lot of facts to these sort of circumstances, groups, events, activities, working groups that they've had over time. So for Grand Theft World listeners, we not only break down the current events, most of which that are censored during the week, we provide you with contextual history, we give you the source notes, the references, we do deep dives, and this really empowers you with an understanding of context and history so that you can make more informed decisions in your life. There's also a community, a membership where you guys can actually ask questions and we can get into the show and share evidence. And there's a town hall weekly for Grand Theft World for those who listen to it and are interested in covering the stories that we don't get to during a six hour show. Listening to it an hour a day, you could uh, easily consume the week's news, but you're gonna have substance and meaning and context and understanding. And with that, you can make higher quality decisions in your life. So if you're interested in more quality in your life, go to grandtheftworld.com, click podcast at the top, and we'll see you there. Thank you. These allegations are false. This isn't Grand Theft Auto, folks. This isn't a video game. What are the most surprising things that you discovered once you started pulling on that thread, who he was connected to, what institutions he was influential over, what events he participated in? You don't have to think about it, dude. I got this quote because uh, you say you didn't know much about Klaus Schwab. I made it my job to, as soon as this happened, I'm like, okay, this guy's their front man. Let me learn about the official history of the World Economic Forum. I got their 40 year history. I got every book that Klaus Schwab has written or ghost written. I went through those books. This is one of the most interesting passages. Come on, man. Come on.